if you uh, need anything, I can't help you with parking. <laughs> I can't help you with parking. I wish I could. But if there's anything you, I can do for you while you, uh, you're here at the challenge, sir, uh, just let me know. We'll try to make you comfortable. Okay. I'm Jim Tucker. Uh, you've gotten emails from me, but this is what I look like. Um, I'm, we really appreciate the Challenger Center's hosting these lunches. It's just, except for the parking, it's ideal in every way. Uh, so I want to thank you again. I um, want to also thank my grad assistants, Ashley J for Ashley Jackson, Ashley R for Ashley Reader, and because you saw Jackson a, a lot of times on your message, and for Christina. Christine. Christina. 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 <laughs> um, they, without them, I couldn't make this happen, as you well know. This is a special day. This is our eighth McKee Learning Lunch, a unique learning activity designed to address, not to resolve, which is kind of different. Because many times we want to fix things, and things do need to be fixed. But before we can fix them, we have to understand them especially with what are called often wicked problems. Wicked problems that have stood the test of time and don't seem to have a resolution. And we have those. So the McKee Learning Lunch is designed specifically to bring together a group of knowledgeable, visionary citizens of all ages and groups represented and talk about an issue. And the issue for today is what? What y'all come here and talk about? School start, time. start time. That's right. And I, my wife reminded me that this issue was first raised in our house when our youngest was in middle school. He had to write a research paper. And for whatever reason at that time in the 90s, he wrote his paper on school start time. So this is not a new issue. It's just one that seems like it won't go away, and we need to do whatever we need to do to address it. So, welcome to the lunch. We are going to have a speaker, very short, TED Talk type speaker, someone that you, most of you probably already know. After Roger is finished, then we eat. So, we listen and then we eat, and we talk after that, while we eat. Roger Thompson has a doctorate in education from the University of Tennessee. Officially, he is retired <coughs> from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, but he's still teaching. He has been a distinguished member of the criminal justice faculty of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga for 40 years. He's not a older than he looks. <laughs> With special recognition given by the University of Tennessee Alumni Association, recipient of the Public Service Award in 2014, for his many contributions at local, state, and national levels. Nevertheless, connection to UTC continues on a part-time basis. Beyond the academic role, Dr. Thompson has been a certified driving instructor for more than 20 years, with status also as third party examiner in Tennessee. Until I talked to him the other day, I had no idea what all this meant. His work involves, well, he is currently a licensed driving instructor in both Tennessee and Georgia. His work involves primarily behind-the-wheel instruction and evaluation for diverse populations ranging from the new teenage driver, refugees, and new arrivals to the United States, and driving evaluations for Siskin Hospital for physical rehabilitation and referrals by vocational rehabilitation. He is collaborating with medical fields at the national level in terms of traffic safety. Dr. Thompson has been a strong advocate for crime prevention efforts in environmental design, violence prevention, and a perennial choice 
A voice challenging early school start time, which is when I met him, because we worked together on the gang tanks and task force. And he's given influence and impact in all of those areas, especially with, relate, with respect to the early school start time because of its impact on human behavior and academic performance. So we welcome Dr. Thompson today to share his thoughts and sentiments about this topic. Thank you. I'll preface my remarks by saying, although I'm an academic, putting the lunch right behind me puts the pressure on. Say, let's keep it short, let's keep it focused, let's go through and allow them the time for you to do your work. I wear several hats, and what you've heard is I have been an academic, I remain an academic, and part of what I look for in our community were those levels of connection at times with the negative behaviors of society. So I would study crime. I would study ways in which we could prevent it. And one series of studies on my part started looking at truancy, started looking at dropouts, and ways in which we're trying to figure out how we increase business in the legal system when in fact we would measure success by saying, let's reduce those loads. The point that surfaced and I have, by reason of my work with kids, I can tap the pulse in terms of what their passions are and how this affects them. And what I bring to you today is the fact that we have a problem and we need to be able to talk it through, work it through, and see if we can solve it. But that early start time comes back and goes against body chemistry of our kids. When I saw the new recommendation, eight to 10 hours, I know the kids getting up at 4.30 in the morning to get ready and to check in for that first period of class shortly after seven. Take the clock back, eight hours, 10 hours, and basically you better go to bed right after you eat your evening meal, if we're looking at adequate sleep. Two important items that I think I would say serve to guide the conversation today. Healthy People 2020 gives us 10 years to work on goals, objectives, and to, in some way, strengthen and build healthy people, and healthy communities. A couple of new categories were added since 2010. And these are the ones that jump out and invite not only our focus, but at some point our attention. One that has been added is adolescent health. And saying our kids, face turbulent times and we're going to have to help them be able to navigate through some of those challenges. The negatives, somehow we're going to be asked to address homicide, suicide, but those that are checking out early in life. Another area that enters into this is mental depression and to know that sometimes that takes it to that level of conclusion. One of the connections over here is sleep deprivation moves us into a state of depression, and it's hard to get out of it. You cannot go back and make up for it on weekends, and you have those fatigue factors in life. But my point is, we're halfway through the cycle, and the opportunity stands before us to say, can we begin and have something to show by the time this report is due? Adolescent health 
the emphasis on, is on positive development, building solid relationships, being able to handle the stress factors that surround them. We can go through a list that motor vehicle crashes are one of the top areas in which kids not only go through an experience life, but check out early. Many of us are aware. As we see the pictures, as we hear the reports, what level of vulnerability is there? The substance abuse, the teenage pregnancy, the truancy, the dropouts, part of it surrounds can we design a better system that offers encouragement, that builds in the support basis. We have a public safety feature with dismissal early in the afternoon. We don't have parents home. And from the standpoint of going through and saying, we see the crime rate spike. And at times, the level of activity that follows a company from three to five. Say, can we, again, design so that it would be more supportive of their intellectual ability when they are ready to learn and provide some comforts on the part of the community itself. That's one. A second topic they're going to ask us to focus on in the coming years that is directly related to health, well-being, is the whole area of sleep and how critical it is and how it's a determinant in addition to nutrition, in addition to physical exercise to our health. And asking that it be a broad public education and going through making strides and differences so that our health is kept in balance. Under good sleep, we have the ability to have that immune system do the battle force. Whereas with sleep de deprivation, we begin to have a very weak immune system and the body cannot fight back. We have attention to diabetes. And the reason this is important is to know that we're talking about both the physical and emotional health. We're not just talking about grades and can they perform better. We're talking about the total step and saying we need to be looking at these pictures because this will take us into later life. And if we start here and picking up some of the problems, we've got a long road ahead of us. Okay, they point out in terms of the academic performance, the fact that it's going to be stronger if we're awake and if we're not going through stages of, you know, just trying to become semi-conscious. And the work is more effective with safety in mind. Sleep depri deprivation introduces us to heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity. It's one of the items being given attention, but more significantly, that area of depression. Okay? Now, those are two highlights of saying those that are in the health industry and those that are working in this field, somehow we need to be starting to pull together and say, what would happen if we would put a target out there and say, here's something in this community that could make a difference. In the handout, and that I go through and simply illustrate a couple of changes that are coming. One, Fairfax, Virginia, just introduced and rolled into play starting this academic year where they changed the bell schedule so everybody starts after 8 o'clock. It's been a community effort. 
It has involved a broad section of different partnerships, but the point is they wanted that level of delay and made it so that they could talk through the logistics, the distractions, the disturbance factors, the financial end, and the like. But the point is they reached the finish line. I added in there, I'm not familiar with all the details, but Nashville is using public transportation in part. And just saying, it looks like one of our challenges has to deal with how we move people efficiently and effectively. And to what degree in that, there are different possibilities. I know in past research, a county in another state basically just said, the school starts at nine, be there. And did not offer transportation in any form or fashion, saying, you figure it out. But we have computers that could be pulling through in the evening hours, we have networks, and just to go through and say, if the logistics are there, I'm satisfied that we have the intellectual horsepower to begin to go through and say, are there ways that we can do this better? Okay. From my standpoint, I talk to the kids. Likewise, I observe in our community. I was part of the gang task force, many others were as well. But anytime people would come back and say, where would you invest? The truth is, it comes back in the prevention arena. We can lock up, we can deal with the, you know, the business of the courts. Unfortunately, what it means is we're losing a lot of talent by way of dropout, by way of, you know, the fact that they do not achieve a degree or they do not have the potential for the career opportunities that may be available. I just attended and participated in career college. It was exciting. To see the passion of the kids and their enjoyment of what's available. I've also gone in and been a special speaker at 7 a.m. And I saw more faces being made. And I'm sure it was probably under threat of you know, if they go to sleep on me, here's how we address it. But just being able to tap and go through and say, we have four years before the report is due. And I would challenge the medical community, I would challenge the educational institutions, I would challenge those that are involved in creating that type of network. Basically, we get our feet wet, we get our hands dirty, and we begin to wrestle with this and see if we can find a better solution. Some enjoy, our magnet school enjoy. And if I had to go through and say they are happy, others are coming through and just saying this is a real struggle. From a, an adult viewpoint, our job is to get our best disability. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. If you look around the room, you will see a number of younger people who went to school not all that long ago. That's by design, so that we can hear their voice as well as those of us who went to school back when he described, it's nine o'clock, you get there on your own. And I remember using the city bus or parents taking me or whatever. But we have a wonderful cross-section of very wise and intelligent people here today to discuss this issue. There are three assignments that are due before you leave. So this is your price for lunch. 
The first one is, on your table are a stack of three by five cards. If you would pick that up right now before we <laughs> release you for, to get food, write on that card any question that comes to mind before we start the discussion. Any question that you have about this topic. It doesn't have to be a long question or a comprehensive question or a complex question. Just whatever comes to mind as a question. We will assemble these later and report them back to you. But that's the first assignment. Give you about oh, 30 seconds to do that. Three questions, and we begin with the first question. 
Uh, and then we'll just kind of go through the panel, but that doesn't mean we have to be that structured. If you have a, a point that needs to be emphasized and you want to make that point, feel free to raise your hand or interrupt or just be nice and say it because we're eager to have whatever opinions you have brought to the table. So the first question, well, let's introduce the panel members. Let's give your name and and uh, where are you from? Sure. Uh, my name is Jessica Ivins, and I'm a faculty member at Center Center, which is the U.S. Design School here in downtown Chattanooga. And I'm Daryl Monroy. I'm a current UTC student, graduate student here at, at UTC, and I'm one of the faculty students. I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm Wayne Brown. I'm currently a board of managers, one of the board of managers for the Tennessee PTA. Hmm. Uh, Sarah Ziegler, and I'm an academic consultant with the Southeast Core Office, which is a division of the Tennessee Department of Education. I'm Michelle Ziegler, I'm with the, Dis the Disabilities Office at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. And Perry Story here at the General Center. Mm -hmm. You know, and I couldn't ask for a more representative uh, group of individuals than just kind of fell into place. Mm -hmm. But while we're at it, let's very quickly go around the room, name and what you represent. Mm -hmm. Starting with you. Greg Heath, I'm a professor here at UTC. Uh, I'm the GM of Brandon Row AHA, alumni of DePont University. I'm Lisa Magnano, executive director with Carter. I'm Rick Smith, superintendent of Kennedy School. I'm Bill Almer, director of Community <laughs> Services Health Department. Tom McCauley, uh, Mr. Carrick from the McCauley Family Foundation. Ray Bond, uh, Medical Society and Medical Foundation. Thank you, Carlson. I'm the Experiential Learning Coordinator here at UTC. Cordell Carter, CEO of Tech Town. Brian Cotter, Chattanooga Police Department. I'm over Sector 2, which is East Lake, East Chattanooga, and all three ships. Um, I'm Ashley Reeder, I'm Dr. Tucker's graduate assistant. Justin Booker, Director of Community Engagement at CGLA. Priscilla Tucker, I work at WUTC. Audra Thompson, UTC. Jennifer Lipkey, UTC School Ed. Grace Terrell, a second year grad student studying school psychology, also one of Dr. Tucker's graduate assistants. Julie Gumbarner, CEO of First Things First. Keith Cooper, soon to retire from the community all right, I'm impressed by the, the crowd that we have here today. So let's talk. Uh, Jess, what is the first question that you all address? And then what did your table kind of summarize what they said about it? Sure, so the first question is, how did start time affect your school experience? And we went around and discussed it and it seems like I was the only, I was the only person that had a really rough time getting up in the at least from what, from what we can remember. The younger <laughs> um, But uh, Greg and Michael over there uh, to the, uh, the far left in the green and the orange, uh, they said that their school started relatively late and that it didn't seem to be an issue for them. Uh, Brian, the, the uh, police officer over there, um, I just thought this was funny and had to share it, that when he would miss the bus, he would skateboard down the hill <laughs> to a street and hitchhike his way to school, which I thought was pretty awesome. I did not do that. Um, but overall, it didn't, from what we can remember, the s school start time wasn't a huge deal, but it, it seemed to affect me the most, because I've always, I'm not a morning person, I'm a very driven person, but I'm not a morning person. I can just remember struggling to get up and being tired all day at school. To elaborate on question number one for my team with Mr. Tom, Kylie Ray, Bonnie, and Bank um, Carlson, um, and I'm Daryl and Reagan. Um, so we also had kind of like a well-round range of school experiences, and I'll start with mine first. Um, I graduated high school not so long ago, um, the year 2011. So it's interesting, because I, I grew up in Dalton, Georgia, so about 40 minutes from here, and we started at 820. Um, I was also part of you know the after-school programs, but I can see how the first two years of high school, it affected me because I had to ride a bus. So if that changed junior year to where I was fortunate enough to be able to drive to school, that was an hour of sleep at least that I can for sure count on that I that I was gaining that hour. 
more. So that made a bigger role the last couple years for me because I was involved in sports, trying to get ready for college. Um, so I can see how speaking on those first two years versus the last two years, how it affected me. I was more tired the first two years versus the last two years I had that extra hour. Um, but at our table, we also talked, um, Mr. Tom McCauley talked about how his, his school was actually out um, longer. So I believe it was 12 hours that he went to school. Um, and he can elaborate if, if he wants on this, um, how back then it was more geared towards uh, the term uh, that Ms. Ray Bond, what did you use the term that for was more agrarian. agrarian. Um, so they had the school was made around of the agrarian um, society at the time, that's how the school was structured, breaks the time, you know, you had to get out earlier in order to then dedicate it to your farm afterwards. So um, the issue, it has been around, it's just been, it's changed to, of course, as our society changes, the issue just kind of reformats it. So a lot of, um, one of the common points that we talked about too now, how technology is tying in with our start time and how it's affecting um, our students now and with the biological component of their staying up later but could that also tie into the art technology now so it's just what we talked about for the question and to tie in with that we, did, we touched on the technology also because uh, at our table we didn't have it so that wasn't an issue when it was time to go to bed there wasn't anything to keep you up <laughs> and so looking at that we had a different outlook on how did that affect us. It was the norm. We didn't have anything to compare it to. Uh, there was no such thing as a later start time. Everybody went to school at this time, so there was nothing to talk about uh, that was expected. So our, our view on did it affect us negatively, we don't know. <laughs> nothing to compare it to because it was all the same. So. Uh, in in uh, question number one, you have to make sure and get people from different areas, different communities, because if you don't, you may not, you, you, you'll only get one side of it. Um, we found out pretty quickly that we were a bunch of nerdy English teachers that looked forward to getting up early <laughs> and getting to school. Um, you know, in my personal experience, our school started at 8 o'clock, but your extracurricular activities, your clubs and things like that, um, and I played softball, so sometimes our softball workouts were at 6 o'clock in the morning before school, so you had a time to work out and shower, which some of us did not, and that always caused probably some extra issues later on in the day. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it was not, a, it was never a problem for me, and then we kind of had a side conversation when we got up here that, you know, then the option came open when you came to college, and I actually came to UTC, um, that you could pick when your classes were, but I still went to school at the same time. I still went to college at the same time I went to, you know, grade school. I didn't make that option, and, and I was lucky. I did not like night classes. I have a lot of things to do, so I did not want to have classes at night. Um, but, yeah, it's good. I guess we kind of have the same thing. You know, we, we didn't have anything to compare to. It was pretty much just here's what it is. You get to school or you get a hand on the back of the head. So. I have a comment to that, 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 that I meet, Superintendent, I meet in, uh, monthly with a, a, a group of uh, high school students and they're generally juniors and seniors and they're selected by, by their student peers and they're representing their school and we talk about uh, a, a lot of topics, a lot of different things. And I, I shared with him yesterday that I was coming to this meeting, didn't know what the, didn't know really, I knew what the topic was but didn't know how the meeting would run. And so I just asked them an opening question yesterday. I said, Tell, so given the fact that you represent all of our 19 high schools um, starting at different times of, of the morning and different times of the afternoon, what, what, what thought could I take to the meeting from, from high school kids? And a lot of conversation. And, uh, and I've got, you know, I've got regular, what I would call regular public schools. I've got magnet schools in the room. I've got STEM school in the room. Um, all, all of our schools. And, and so a lot of conversation until the last young lady raised her hand and said, Mr. Smith, I don't understand why, there's a, why this topic is, is being discussed. And I said, well, what, and these, now keep in mind, these are very, very bright, thoughtful kids, first of all, uh, because they're representative. And, and, and she said, well, my school starts at 9 o'clock, but I go to work at 6 a.m. 
I have chosen to use the time available to me to, to do what I need to do. Now, I, I didn't ask the obvious. I didn't, I didn't ask her, as many students do, you have to take care of their, their siblings. Sometimes they have to take care of their family. Um, and so I didn't cry, but I thought that was very interesting. So the idea that your day started with an activity, and this activity being an athletic activity, which was your choice, I, I, I think I have to put on the table for us to think about, and I mentioned this to our group, this whole idea of community and involvement and engagement around this topic has to be part of this. It can't just be a scheduling matter, because a scheduling matter may not be the issue, or, 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 or as much of the issue. In, any response or comment? Okay. Um, at our table, three of us started school after 8 o'clock, um, and fourth grade started early, very early. <laughs> um, but she did say that she wasn't fully functioning at, during those early classes, and I can say that witnessing my children going through the Hamilton County Schools. We moved here from Colorado when my kids were very young. Um, so my oldest started in Colorado and he started school at nine o'clock. Then he went into a magnet school and started school at nine o'clock and he did incredibly well. Uh, my two youngest ones go to Hamilton County Public Schools and they start at 715. And I can look back at their transcripts and their first and second block every year, their grades are the lowest. Um, they really struggle. So we also talked about safety issues. Um, the fact that we have young kids at the bus stops at 615 when it's still pitch black out. And my little squat daughter walking down the hill to the bus stop in the pitch black with a busy street crossing. And it's just a huge safety issue when, from a parent's perspective. But also, I have three children and all three of them have been in car accidents driving to school. And no, they weren't on their phones. I can guarantee that because I make them lock their phone in their, in their backpack in the back seat when they get in the car. Um, but the most recent one was just two weeks ago when she told her car after driving for 11 months. She, she drove with her permit, very responsible young lady, um, wanted to drive as much as possible to get prepared for being able to drive to school. And two weeks after she started driving, she had a telephone pole on the way to school. Um, and she has lost several friends in car accidents driving to school in the morning. So it's a huge safety concern for, for us. Um, and we also talked about the kind of the overachiever mentality that, that School now is very competitive, and that the ability to get into college is highly competitive. So we have a population of young folks that are super engaged in a lot of different things, but that takes away from their ability to get this rest that they need. And when you were talking about the eight to 10 hours, my kids are both elite athletes, and they come home from school and they take a nap because they're exhausted from getting up at 5.15 in the morning. Then they go to practice, and they practice until eight o'clock at night. Then they do homework. So there's no going to bed at eight o'clock be able to get up and get those eight to ten hours. My kids are lucky if they get five or six hours of sleep a night to be able to get to school on time. So it's, it's a little scary from a parent's perspective to have them out on the roads that early. Uh, we had an expert at our table, actually. Uh, it gave us, uh, we couldn't remember our start times. <laughs> <laughs> she went all the way back to elementary school. <laughs> uh, but I, I think uh, some takeaways, and I think it's very com common what we're hearing here is, and uh, a summary on that is that uh, we're, we're living in a society, our kids are living in a society where uh, they want it all and they can do it all. They have been convinced that, that if, they want, if they want to do it, they can do it. And I think uh, we talked about personal responsibility, we talked about parent responsibility, because when you're dealing with things such as the media, that these kids are immersed in all the time, uh, there is no such thing as a bedtime. There, unless somebody is taking personal responsibility to turn it off, or a parent's helping to take responsibility to turn it off, or do whatever, we, that self-policing type of situation, we had it sometimes because it's built into our society. Everybody's, everybody's structure is so different now, and we talked about a little bit like a, uh, the gaming industry and all these things, these guys do this to, to immerse you. So you, uh, kids are convinced right now that multitasking is a good thing and it helps them relax, but two hours later, they're still in the game, they're still going, they're still turned on, and, and they're just being sucked into this. But one of the things we, we sort of conclude on this, it, it, you know, the effect of the start time, whether, because actually she started at a 7.15 start and also, with, what was it, a nine? You had a, I think a nine? Yeah, college, I started at nine. Yeah, and so it really wasn't about the start time, it was all the other stuff that was being built into it. 
before school stuff, after school stuff, parents need to get a, a, the child to school at a certain time, uh, sports, work, all these other things that she chose to be a part of and put it all put it all together. So it's the start times are just a, 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 just a it's a it's a benchmark that we're looking at, but the, the dynamics of it are so much more. And, and one of the things that being a high school principal, one of the things that I saw and I brought up when we talked about health issues and stuff, there was a trend that I saw starting this is years and years ago where the high school students were coming with their cup of coffee. And we have a concern about it. We met with our parents and say, you know, your kids, you know, you know, your kids are stopping and getting Starbucks on the way in. Why do I get them a car? Because I want them to be awake when they get to school. And we started like at 15. And so we were concerned about the parents' work. Well, the coffee becomes five hour, the coffee becomes the red bull, the shots. coffee yeah. because they're trying to keep driving and driving, and our society tells them it's okay. You can you can still do it all if you want to. I think our kids are suffering from that and and that, so the start time is just, it's a point, but there's a lot of other things swirling around the start time. Which supports the superintendent's yes. uh, statement that it's a community issue. And I think that takes us to question number two. And rather than start at that end, uh, let's start in the middle. Uh, Jess, why don't you read question number two and then we'll go the other way and back. Um, so question number two says, if school start time currently is a significant problem, what should we do about it? Um, and one thing we talked about at our table um, was kind of like what we just talked about. You have to get the community on board to understand that there is a problem. Um, and it's not, you know, like Perry said, it's not just school start time. There's a lot of other factors that feed into that. Like most, you know, issues with, with school, it's usually not just a one. If we fix this, we fix everything. Um, and I know Mr. Smith can probably <laughs> speak more to that. But, um, and we also talked about you can pull in the community and get them involved to understand what the issue is, but until you get them to buy into it and take ownership of it, it's not going to be successful. It's not going to fix itself. They have to understand and, and start asking questions like, what can I do to make this better? I apologize. I called you Jess. That's Jess. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> well, we talked about the same thing as Superintendent Smith was talking about, that we have to get everybody has to be you have to have all the stakeholders involved and continue the type of discussions that we have now uh, because he bought uh, tools that we have currently here in Hamilton County County we have a three-tier uh, bus transportation where they start at different times so it is you can do it to push the start times however you have to get everybody involved in that type of discussion um, and, and possibly do a pilot and then reevaluate and see, okay, what does, what, what, what have we really accomplished by moving those start times? And what is a, what would, what, how would we date it being successful? Does it mean that the grades go up? Does it mean that we're, we're healthier? You have to be able to say what is success, even if you do that. And who would measure that? also contain pretty much the same message so we were discussing working as a community communicating it working it collectively um, working collectively we need to all be there of different you know different members of the community different socioeconomic status people that represent our community everyone has to be there to present what problems they're facing that we can all work together to come up with pretty much the logistics of how to resolve it by continuing these talks, you know, how we're meeting today, branch continuing it is pretty much the main thing is making sure it's, it's continuously spoken, that it's not just once in the media and it's forgotten the next day. Um, continuing to have the talks. Uh, to echo some of the other comments, uh, we, we talked about um, identifying the obstacles so what are the obstacles to addressing these problems, or this problem, I should say, and who objects to it? Uh, we also did talk about uh, engaging the community and getting everyone's voice involved in the discussion, but we there, there seemed to be a consensus around the table that, okay, we know this is a problem, but we don't know exactly what the obstacles are to addressing it. Um, you know, because this isn't something that any of us really studies deeply or is intimately familiar with, um, you know, from a, 
a, a controversial issue standpoint. So I think to, um, understanding what the obstacles are and understanding you know, who objects to changing or addressing the problem was, was a big theme for question number two. Sure. Uh, I think uh, very similar, I, I think one of the things that, t uh, I think sometimes we see this as a transportation driven issue and there's a lot of factors involved with that with regulations and complications, especially uh, Cordell would bring up special needs children and how, it's, how the transportation happens and all the other things. I think it's almost, uh, we said research too, but how do you sort of separate some of those a little bit because probably when we sit down and talk about it, we talk about transportation and how kids get to school versus maybe the design of what works best and maybe that research needs to look over there first and then come back in with the back door. And so we don't, we separate the issues and not get it, got it too complicated because uh, uh, I think every time we sort of hear start times, we hear transportation and getting students to school and I know that's a real need, but maybe we need to look at research is what is the best. And that may be by community, by community design that works best depending on distance and location and logistics and these things. Uh, but I think uh, studying it seems to be a real need. We just don't know what the moving parts are right now. Mm -hmm. We talked about very similar things, um, trying to figure out the, the agenda for why the hours are what they are. Um, you know, who's, who's driving this? Why are they decided to be this hour, these hours? Who set the time frame? Is it driven by transportation or not? You know, what is the purpose of kids being to school at 7.15 versus the ones that go to magnet schools that go at nine versus the ones that go to private schools that go whenever they go. Um, so who's driving the time frame and why? So understanding the purpose. Um, we also talked a little bit, and, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but we spoke a little bit about, you know, these kids these days with the technology and all of that kind of thing, but that's our reality right now. Um, this, yes, the students are involved in a lot of activities because that's the expectation to be able to get into college and students are attached to their phones and attached to their devices because that's their reality right now. So regardless of whether we attach any kind of sentiment to that, or regardless of whether we attach you know, a good or, or a negative or positive view of that, that's reality for, for this group of kids that we're working with. So we need to meet them where they are as well. Yes. I have a question, one's for Rick. Am I mistaken, did Howard change their start time? They did. And what have you seen? Is there an increase in attendance and are they doing better performance-wise? Uh, I want to say the attendance uh, issue is better. I think there's, I think there's other factors uh -huh. to, 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 to talk about there. I think, the, I think it's a much more, and I'm not sure it's a starting time issue, uh, but I definitely think that things but it if you talk to students, uh, you, get, you get a bit of a different story. Okay. Well, well, I've got four. One of the things I think we have to throw on the table, and, and, I, and I, know, I know much of the focus is on secondary age students, which I think is very appropriate. We have hundreds of kids in Hamilton County uh, that are in our buildings in elementary at 6 a.m. and don't leave until 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Hundreds. Of, of kids. So that was that was a surprise to me. Was that surprising to anybody else? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. No. It's amazing. Uh, that's a factor that. But, well, well, we, we talk, talk about that because it's, that's not only a, a it's it's a it's a positive support structure for the students who need that, but it's also a support structure for the parents. Your grandmother had to drop you off at school at six thirty because she had to go to work. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that replicates itself over and over and over again. Same thing in the afternoon. Where would that child be waiting for someone to pick them up if they weren't at school? Yeah, we That's talked about them forever. Then. Yeah. My yeah. husband, and his mom was principal in Chattanooga City Schools, and she dropped him off at 7 o'clock, and she went to work, and he was hanging at the school. <clears throat> That's also the safest time of their lives, and they get fed the most. That's right. you got to remember that, where they're coming from. Yeah, it's a safety structure. Again, a whole community issue. Yeah. Go ahead. I can have a comment off that, and I don't want to speak for you, but Justin made a great point that um, their students, they have they have a mandatory breakfast time at 745, and then you said they're there until 5 in the afternoon? Most of them, yeah. Most of them are there until 5, and I just, I thought that was great that, you know, it's positive, they're reinforcing, like, they have a place to eat, and I don't know, I just thought that was a good connection between the two. Yeah, we did talk at our table a little bit about what happens 
for the, for the students that don't stay after school, but as they get older and they do go home, what happens between three and six when mom, gets, mom or dad gets home? And I was lucky enough that I was able to leave if my kids have an issue. I could leave work or my husband could leave work to go help them or to be with them if they needed me. But I have three kids and they were, they were home alone from you know the time they were in seventh or eighth grade. And there were quite a few times where we had to leave work to go home. So that's you know a little concerning. <laughs> Some of the statistics that you brought up terrified me a little bit since I have a daughter. That's a change, you know, that some of us who are older didn't have that issue because we had a parent at home, right. and now it's just not there. Okay, other comments about question two? <clears throat> then let's move to question three. And Terry, we'll start with you and go that direction. Well, this is sort of what we landed on. I, I think it needs to be studied and researched, and it, it needs to be looked at with parents and students and teachers to gauge the impact and basically look at all the subsets that are involved with that. And, and you know, there's, there's so many different factors that that we have to look at all those. And uh, one of the uh, comments at the table that came up is that really, uh, maybe the question is, should the district even be dealing with the transportation issue? Should they be dealing with how to build the best educational or support structures for, the, and, and then figure out the transportation issue around the educational structures? Because we know that there's sort of driving forces around that. But we also uh, need to uh, try to, uh, someone was very adamant about testing personal responsibility. What, you know, we need to sort of find out what is each individual's personal responsibility in making the right decisions. Uh, and we know that there's, there's students out there self-managing and the families are not involved. We know that all those structures are in place. But there's gotta be, there's gotta be a, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't make the, that personal decision for anybody. That person will, will go to work at six o'clock in the morning, they're gonna go to work at six o'clock in the morning or whatever. But that's something that needs to be sort of looked at. And research was the important key. And we talked about just continuing these conversations, having it become more of a community global issue. I do think that the, the research is the key. I think there's a lot of pretty intelligent people in this room, um, but researching all the different perspectives would be really important. Research the neurodevelopment of children, research the, the health issues, research all the different perspectives on this topic so that we are making a really educated decision and having educated conversations. Uh, we kind of carried on the same thing, talking about Continue that dialogue between all stakeholders, not just people within the schools and not just um, community members, but bringing one of the most important groups to the table being the parents because we can get things moved around where start time is later, but for some kids, all that means is that they can stay up later if there's not a parent there telling them, no, you have to go to bed. Um, you know, so the parents have to kind of be sold on it as much as anybody in the schools um, or anybody else involved because if they're not there telling the kid the dumb iPad or you know get off YouTube or something like that um, and I'm the world's worst I'm on Pinterest at least for an hour or not that's how I that's how I kind of downgrade from the day but um, you know luckily I do have a husband at home that says Sarah put down the put down Pinterest step off step away from your phone but if we don't have parents there to do that with those kids um, then it kind of just defeats the purpose. They can stay up now until 4 o'clock in the morning instead of 2 o'clock if we, if we don't have accountability for the parents as well. And we talk about basically the same things as far as the involvement and the research. Yes, we do need to do more research on the topic. In addition to that, we also need to, to poll the parents and poll other stakeholders and and see what is the real, you know, what is the real issue? Is the start time the issue? Is the ending time maybe the issue? Uh, or what other factors play into uh, the problems that we're having with our children? And just to make sure, you know, don't we don't want to spend a whole lot of time in something that may or may not be a a big concern, but we do need to find out uh, the real issue when it comes to what the start times are good or not good. Um, we also touched on the same point, so we need to look at how it impacts all the different 
sectors of, within our society, you know, business, education field, medical, you know, parents involving the union, presenting the facts, but tailoring it in a way that makes it, hey, you know, the people in the business community, this is why you need to come and help us out and, and discuss this issue. Hey, oh, of course, it's the medical field knows this, how it affects the students, but, you know, bringing in all these different <coughs> sectors, you have to present the facts in a different way. A lot of times, if you present it in one way, it's just not getting across to all the population in the same way. So that's kind of the main overall um, thing that we mentioned, and just to touch base on research, and I'm just going to throw this in because I'm in Dr. Tucker's class. Um, he had um, me read and another classmate a uh, nurture shock. I don't know if anyone in the room has read it um, by Poe Bronson and Ashley Merriman. I definitely recommend it. I liked it. I'm not just saying it because Dr. Tucker was in the room. Um, <laughs> I wrote a book report on it, and one chapter of it, a good chunk is dedicated to the lost hour, which is what we're meeting about today. And it takes a whole bunch of different research studies that were done, um, you know, nationwide, different researchers, um, but from both sides. So it, it argues, you know, the ben benefits and then also, you know, why it doesn't benefit our kids. Um, so I would definitely recommend that if, you know, you can get a, the ebook really cheap online or Amazon or eBay. Um, but it's a great book to, to look into and the research. It, Text you into presenting the facts so you can then go on and read the other studies from the other books or kind of opens your mind more into how it is something that is talked about, it is something that has been researched. Um, so, why is it still an issue? Because it's not a recent issue, like we have all um, discussed, it's been going on for a while. Uh, a lot of what we discuss uh, echoes what's already been said. Uh, we talked about involving all the stakeholders in the discussion, getting a group discussion to um, uh, really address this issue. And I think um, Brian brought up a good point in our group, and he, he said, um, you know, who's going to facilitate the collaboration on this issue? Um, who's going to own it? Who's going to see that it happens? Or that it even, you know, achieves the results that we all want? Would it be the school districts? Would it be local politicians? You know, who would that be? And I think that, that was a really interesting question that left us all thinking, and we weren't really sure what the answer was. But to summarize, we talked about involving all the stakeholders in the issue and you know, um, thinking about who would own this issue and who would own the collaboration in terms of addressing it. Marvelous. Can I make one comment? I, I shared uh, working with uh, freshman students in our freshman experience class and, and the last two cycle, two years. Uh, journaling about this, this is one of the big issues they have to figure out very quickly because they're, when you first see their first, uh, their first journaling is that they want to do it all, they've got it all figured out, they're going to make it work, and, and you check them about this time of year, and it's like, you know, I crashed and burned, I tried to do it all, I, you know, couldn't make classes, couldn't get it all together, and I think, so what we're, what we're talking about is not something that just happens at one point, I think it even happens to adults. Mm -hmm. I think we have adults dealing with the same thing. So I think that's one of the things when we're talking about this with kids. I think this is a this is a society piece that we're all dealing with too, not just uh, not just maybe for our schools, but I think it's a society piece of really trying to just cram so much into your your day. Well, I can certainly speak to that. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I have that problem. We talked yes. at great length about mindfulness and about the ability to just be present and have. Have, just have quiet and I know it drives me crazy if it's quiet I'm like what do I do what do I do now Where, you know I, I can't deal with quiet very well um, and I see that in my kids and, and maybe that I'm perpetuating that a lot but we talked a lot about that being um, something that is there's no time for it anymore there's no time in people's lives to just be present not think about what's coming up or not think about what just happened but to just be here it's, that puts a lot of pressure on me I'd be really interested in talking to Fairfax, Virginia at the end of their school year. I don't know if they're uh, similar to us in terms of the number of schools they're not at all. Brother, do you, you know the answer to that? I didn't look at their numbers, but from a community perspective, I think it would be interesting to hear some feedback <coughs> in terms of how did they bring the coalition together I'm more interested in results. I want to know if after bringing the coalition together and they actually change the start time, what do they look like 
in May? Did it really impact? Was there really change? What did the students think? What did the parents think? What did the teachers see? Which brings us back to the consistent statement that we need research, we need research, we need research. And it's not research that's one single variable or two. It's a lot of variables. And that's pretty comprehensive. Any summary thoughts that people in the audience or uh, on the panel would like to make? I, yes. I just had just, just just one thought about this research piece here. And I think research is going to be critical, obviously, for any policy changes. You know, you have to be able to support the change. Um, and and I see that there's information about the Fairfax study. There are a couple other studies, uh, programs that have been launched across the country. But as we look forward. We need to look at what has been done before, but we need to look at the before and after. We really need to do that because you know, in order for us to be able to talk about policy changes, we need to know what we can expect from the policy change. And so, I mean, I can appreciate the Fairfax piece. Uh, they, 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 and I, I too, Julie, like you, I, I want to know what happens, uh, what does it look like after the fact? But I don't mean immediately after. I mean, what about a year after they started the game? Let's see exactly. what they have accomplished. What 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 changes? I talked to the uh, Richard Smith about about performance issue, which is huge for not just our public school system, but all of us. You know, as well as for businesses coming into our community. You know, we don't know what can we expect from our, our growing young workforce. You know, so you know we need to look at. Uh, where we are now, where others have been before they enacted the change, and then what have they looked like after they've done it for a while. So, I mean, we need to look at some longitudinal kinds of research in order to be able to make a determination as to what can we expect, you know, from making a positive change like this. Other summary thoughts? And one. When Roger put down all the kind of advantages and disadvantages, there's one phrase that was abused, and that's brain development. Um, we now know that you know, certain things help cognitive brain development. We also know that sleep helps clean out the brain, mm -hmm. takes plaque out, and you know, is, is a major indicator of things like Alzheimer's. Uh, so, literally, the, the sleep cycle repairs the brain, uh, which can have some pretty long-term impacts as you go forward. So, I would add brain development in that list. Excellent. Yes. Of um, uh, the Medical Society, we have a thousand physician members, and um, when we started a youth leadership forum to prepare uh, young people to encourage them to consider careers in medicine. We talked about the sessions to ask uh, 10 years ago. One of the sessions our doctors insisted that we we add is a presentation on the importance of sleep and, and what sleep does, how it helps their academic um, performance, and how it helps their personal development. So I think the medical community is very aware of this issue, and I've not heard. I've only heard doctors speak strongly that this is an issue they see in their pediatric practices. It's an issue they see um, internal medicine people, the same thing. I think we are all sleep sleep deprived, but um, I think that there's a strong body of medical evidence that's well supported um, within our community. And I think you hear a rousing cheer if this is an issue that we could do something about because the, the doctors are very concerned about what's happening to our kids. What time do they start their rounds? They, oh, they start their sleep deprived too. <laughs> <laughs> their whole their whole educational system. But oh, the, yeah. Reforming medical education is a whole different issue. <laughs> <laughs> Baby oh. steps. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts before we have the final assignment, which will take you about three minutes? Okay. Uh, Ashley will pass around a single sheet of paper. And on that sheet of paper are two questions relative to this experience that you've had today, kind of your follow-up thought. And then we, I really want to thank you all for being here. You will receive a summary synopsis of the data that, we have, that you've given us and that we have heard. 
You will also have access eventually to the video if you want to uh, remember what you said or capture what others have said. And want to thank you for the, the video options that you've provided. So if you would look at that sheet of paper and tell us what's the most important thing you learned today and what question that's unanswered that you're leaving with. And then thank you very much.